mizi ndo zirukitwa na mtanga kurewa kuti ganda ndo rakachinja asi usati asimba una kuchinja kurewa kuti akabvisa simithi wemurunga asi pana simithi wechitema kurewa kuti akabvisa rotation friend asi takatsveta zanu pf iri kungotora from the rotation template the opposition has failed across the country all the local authorities they control Ah, a shame. 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 To you. I have specifically asked them that they should not include my uh, my name on the ballot paper. in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. We are here in Blawayo to understand the issues in this election, to ensure that everyone is heard. Umuntu wonke jikelele must be heard on this program. The voice of everyone matters. Now, this week on this, the free talk, in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation, I am in conversation with Nelson Chamisa, the leader of the Triple C, the Citizens Coalition for Change. He launches here in Blawayo the Triple C Manifesto. And I'm going to sit down with him and go through all the details of this manifesto. And here, if you, the voters, you, the voters, should trust him as your next president. Now, this is the free talk in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom and I, your host as usual, Dara Blessed Mflam. Now we talk here in the city of kings and queens. Umfazi Ishain Dod in Tutu Ziatunya. I'm here for you. Join me after this break. Now welcome to this, the Free Talk in Power Partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. Father Zimbabwe, Ubaba, Elizwe, Lonke, Muntuonke, Jikelele, the Father Zimbabwe. And we are going to be speaking from this, his comfort, in Blawayo. Join me now as I talk to Nelson Chamisa, the president of the Citizens Coalition for Change, who is looking for your vote. Welcome, uh, Ad President Advocate Nelson Chamisa, to this the free talk. Now, just yesterday, uh, you were launching the manifesto of the Triple C. Uh, can you just 
tell us, um, you know, the highlights of this manifesto? Well, I must say that there's a difference between uh, a manifesto and a blueprint. Ours is a blueprint. Um, a manifesto is just a statement of intentions, but a blueprint is an articulation of a trajectory, the steps, uh, the signposts uh, with timelines and in some cases with budget lines. And that's what we did uh, with the document that we launched yesterday. Um, the blueprint is um, a clear step-by-step uh, -step account of uh, the direction that the country must take going forward. And we are so happy uh, that um, there's been overwhelming a response from the people of Zimbabwe, from the citizens of Zimbabwe, from investors, from the international community. Everyone seems to appreciate that uh, ours is a detailed plan and a very comprehensive and uh, compelling um, narrative on how we are going to resolve the issues of Zimbabwe. Obviously, people will be looking into, into the gaps and the weaknesses of the blueprint. Uh, do you think there are any in this, in this blueprint? Well, no gaps, no weaknesses. But of course, you must understand that with all proposals, with all uh, uh, police uh, suggestions, there's always going to be a critique. That is the essence of the blueprint. People must be able to engage the blueprint and be able to say, we are happy with this bit, we are not happy with that bit. That is the conviviality of the exchange we need. Citizens must engage on what they believe is the common and best solution for the country. And I must say that this document is our humble submission um, to Zimbabweans and to the world on how we are going to extricate our country uh, from the jaws of tyranny, from the jaws of uh, the crocodile. You spoke about free education. Uh, uh, President Chamisa. Now, now, some some believe that this is this is just a, a wild dream. Uh, what, what is your assertion on that? Well, I must say that all our proposals are anchored on careful consideration of the implications financially. We have done the math, we have done the budget, we have done the numbers and the figures, and I can tell you that what we are putting on the table is something that is bankable, credible, and achievable. Uh, Give us the opportunity, give us a chance. We will do it. It has been done elsewhere. Look at Zambia uh, and, and it's working. No, but yeah. where do you propose to get the financing? Well, we have the financing. We told you that just to look at the uh, different financing, financial models that we have, if you look at the illicit financial flows, if you look at the uh, uh, corruption that is taking place, three billion is already saved. And that is the kind of deployment, redeployment of the resources that we need to do. But you're looking at a crumbling health infrastructure, you're looking at a crumbling road network, and you're looking at all social facets that have been crumbling. And do you think free education would be affordable or it would make things worse? Because we have learned in Zimbabwe that free things are not really free. Well, nothing is really free, but we are saying that government must take a redeployment of resources into primary education because that is the foundational basis of any society. The foundation of a child is literacy, numeracy, and those are all attained at primary education level. And that is what we must focus on, and that is what we must deploy our resources on. We must really know where our bread is buttered. It is buttered on education. We are an education nation. We must invest in education. We must invest in the future of our children. So yes, we have every else, every other thing that is collapsing, but we must redeploy our faculties onto education and then we'll look at health, and then we'll look at other issues. And there are various financial and financing models that are going to be deployed to deal with the crumbling infrastructure. Triple P's are going to be used. We're going to have uh, private-public partnerships for other areas where infrastructure is required, and we'll be able to, to, to police them. You, you were talking, you, you are against color. Yes. Why? Well, this is feedback from the citizens themselves. This is not my idea. It is the citizens who are saying this is a burden on us. Yes, it's good to have children on a continuous learning assessment, but we must be able to get it from the parents, not to impose as government or as policymakers onto the parents, onto the experts, onto the education, uh, educationists. We need to engage those who are experts in education. The Zimbabwe Teachers Association, uh, uh, Progressive Teachers Union of Zimbabwe, are the tools, the teachers' associations themselves. They but do you think they have not been engaged? They have not been engaged. And that is why it is so unpopular. 
It connects with the people. It rhymes. There's rhythm in that message. You know why? Because it's capturing the imaginations, the anxieties, and the hopes of the people of Zimbabwe. And we are going to review the curriculum. It's a big issue because it is coming from the people. You would rather have our kids go to school to study, um, to, to sing uh, songs about the Queen? No, certainly not. We want the curriculum to be defined by the parents, to be defined by the students themselves. They have to be consulted in terms of their expectations. But ultimately, we have experts, we have templates, and we must refer to those who are experts. Headmasters, teachers must be consulted in terms of uh, any curriculum that we are going to have. So it's not as if we are saying when we remove this, then we have nothing. There's a replacement, but the curriculum has to be a product of wide consultation in line with our philosophy. Citizens first, citizens at the center. Parents first, parents at the center. Education is, education is first, education is at the center. The teacher must be the primary practitioner to consult and to refer to in terms of uh, coming up with the curriculum. So some people say government must do for people what they can't do for themselves. And you're proposing free education for everyone, including those who can afford. Well, those who can afford, I'm sure, they're private, uh, univers uh, private uh, schools and private universities. They can always go to those private institutions. But government is basically the custodian and guarantor of uh, public goods public services to the public. So we must do the best to the maximum number of people. And that is what we are putting on the table. You tend to mining present in your, in your blueprint. And, and you propose to make Zimbabwe a global leader in mining. Mm -hmm. Is it not already? We are talking, talking about a $12 billion mining economy in Zimbabwe. That's not leadership. Leadership is when you now start to invest in value addition in beneficiation, in making sure that you have finished products out of our minds. But beyond that, we must also invest in institutions of mining technology and mining engineering uh, from a technical college perspective, university perspective. We must actually have the best university uh, of mining in Zimbabwe because we are a mining country. So we must lead in mining technologies. We must lead even in making sure that whatever is coming out of Zimbabwe is global standards around the graduates themselves, around the products that come from mining. The whole value chain has to be studied and we must be able to go back and say when you talk Zimbabwe, you are talking of a mining country and we must lead in technologies, we must lead in standards, we must lead even in how we also treat our workers who are in the mining industry. You, you spoke um, greatly about the currency and the finance. Uh, I, during the launch and you spoke about restoring value on our currency let's talk about that well restoration of value on the currency is restoration on confidence in government confidence in policies so that requires a whole raft of measures number one there has to be proper rights guarantee there has to be predictability of policy consistency of policy remove all the police contradictions the police noise in the cockpit once you have dealt with the fundamentals, people have confidence in the currents. You have actually restored not just confidence in leadership, it's also confidence in the transaction uh, currents that people will be using. So we have to make sure that as a priority, we go to the issue of restoring the confidence in our transacting you know, current. And you believe your government will bring confidence? Well, confidence is a function of uh, trust in leadership also consistency in leadership and we've provided that in the past look at what happened during the inclusive government it's not something that's new we can do it we did it during the inclusive government we can even do much more we need to get the fundamentals right fiscal you know policies monetary policies dealing with the role of the reserve bank how do we make sure that we realign the role of the reserve bank we don't allow the government to be a bully we don't allow the reserve bank to even do quasi-fiscal you know, policies. Quasi-fiscal policies must be removed from the Reserve Bank, but also re-enacting the Reserve Bank Act to make sure that we don't have people raiding uh, coffers uh, from the Reserve Bank. Individual you know, savings must be protected. Individual accounts must be protected. That is the kind of reform that we want to see. But let us, you also spoke about removing the RTGS immediately 
as you get into office. But you are also talking about restoring value of that currency. Now, how do you do this? You remove it, you restore. Is this not confusion in your cockpit, President? Well, I must say that what we are restoring value in is the currency that will come. But there must also be confidence in the currency people are using to transact at the moment. So the U.S. dollar is that residual confidence because it's a global currency. But this is only but for a short time because we can't be a sovereign country without our own sovereign currency. So ultimately we have to go back to our own currency and that currency must have strong value. So I'm talking about short term and long term. In the short term, we'll use the U.S. dollar. But in the long term, we have to come back to our own currency, but on the basis of ability to inspire confidence, to retain value, and to also have policy con consistency and predictability. But how long would it take you to bring back the local currency? What would determine circumstances is obviously the response of the market. Ultimately, you have to be guided by the market as a government. Leadership must be guided by the response from the market, from the citizens, from the investors, and of course from the financiers if, if, and the bankers. If the people are taking you in the wrong direction, and you can see that they're going in the wrong direction, you'll continue to go with them there because you are guided by the people. No, 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 you are guided by the market. The market is the boss when it comes but to the But they are greedy, President. Of course they are. That's why we need intervention by the state. It's an intervention that is uh, important to regulate and make sure that there's accountability. And also, we are able to build an ethical market, an ethical business, ethical labor, and an ethical state. But to be able to build an ethical state, you must take the lead by understanding the fundamentals on the market. So we are not going to be guided by the market cut blood. We are guided to the extent that we must respect market fundamentals, not to come and violate the market fundamentals and expect the economy to be stable. The instability of seen is because there is a disrespect on the fundamentals of the market. Let me take you to the political campaign trail, President. How has it been? It has been very tough, but exciting. I mean, um, impediments, obstacles. But look, the feedback is awesome. Zimbabwe is ripe for change. Change is in the air. You can feel it. And everyone is so hopeful. There's so much hope. People believe in change. People want change. I would say over 77, 80 percent of the people would want change, including ZANU-PF. In fact, people in ZANU-PF want change more than people outside ZANU-PF. So it's a national chorus, it's a national demand, and we are going to provide that platform of but change. President, don't you just have a hinge of doubt in your mind when you see the star rallies that your opponent, President Emerson Dambuzo Mnangagwa, is having across the country compared to yours? Well, look, Mr. Mnangagwa is addressing uh, the entire country uh, per gathering. I'm addressing community meetings. So I have star rallies in communities. He has star rallies for the entire country, busing people, a minimum of 500 buses per rally. And those buses will be doing two and four. So I'm not worried about that, you know. And most of the people who are going there are being commandeered to go there and frog marched to go there. So it's not a worry. You've been They've done it before. You know that Mugabe used to have one million men march. Where were they when he was overthrown? President, you you have um, been talking about this busing. Why are you not busing also? Why should we bus? Because you are cheating yourself. Why should you lie to yourself that uh, you have grand support when you have none? Be realistic. Talk to the people. You must not be forcing people to come and congregate around you. You're just cheating yourself. You're not even cheating those people. So we'll not bust people. We have no intention to mislead people. It's not about the crowds. It's about our ability to have a connecting and credible message to the people of Zimbabwe. And you'll see that people understand where we are and they are working with us. You, you, your rallies have been banned. Allegedly, you say your rallies have been banned. Um, it's not allegedly. You know that the rallies have been banned. It's on record. The police do not even deny this. They, they allege, police allege that you failed to to do it within the confines of the law. And in Bindura, the magistrate agreed with the police, didn't she? Well, look, they can agree in madness. It doesn't make it any lawful. Uh, I can tell you that we follow the law, and they know that all the bans are motivated by politics, particularly ZADOPF, trying to discourage them from allowing us to proceed with rallies in areas where they feel that we are making inroads. 
We are very strong in Bindura. We are very strong in Mass Central. And we have made inroads in those so-called ZANU-PF uh, uh, areas. ZANU-PF is, it, it does not have strongholds. They are neither strong, nor do they have any hold anywhere. They use force, they use violence, they use intimidation and terror on our traditional leaders, on the local citizens, to try and perpetuate their rule and reign. But you have given, probably given ZANU-PF a silver platter. Uh, in Blawayo, in Harare, where you have triple and double nominations. Why did you do that, President? But you know, you, you are better informed that that's ZANU-PF through FAS. Who did that? Those are not triple C members. Where there are triple C members who were robbed in is because they fell for the trinkets uh, from ZANU-PF. They fell for the carrots. Uh, and, and you can isolate those issues. So it's actually occasioned by ZANU-PF. There's no sleep, you know, uh, silver platter we have given to ZANU. We don't give ZANU a free lunch. We are not donors. We are not Father Christmases. We have said, let's go for the election. We did everything. In fact, you must actually be celebrating our ingenuity and our creativity. The strategic ambiguity doctrine worked. Because if we had not done that, we we're going to have 210 double candidates. Because that's what they wanted. But we knew about it. We got our intelligence and we did what was supposed to be done. And there's no... Uh, uh, massive or large-scale uh, harakiri that uh, was going to take place. But this is at the heart, at the core of the opposition. You stand, uh, you know, a risk of losing, for instance, Mount Pleasant. Let's talk Mount Pleasant. Um, you can also talk about um, where Johanna Mamombe is MP, double candidates. These have well, been safe, this, safe I can't speak on behalf of Zanubia. This is a ZANU-PF thing in connivance with ZEC. Do you want me to be the spokesperson of us? Go and ask FAS why they did that. Go and ask ZEC why they allowed that. They illegally allowed double candidates, not signed for by the party. There is no signature from the party. It's not the party that signed for them. It's FAS forging signatures, committing an illegality. It's a criminal conduct. And they know it. The courts even know it. But they are all conniving to subvert the will of the people. But tell you what, the citizens are not stupid. And you think that the citizens, as you see them, would be able to overpower that system that you're talking about? Citizens are far ahead. You know, citizens are not zombies. Citizens are our masters and our bosses. They know who should be in parliament. They know who should be in council. They know who should be the president. So you can't just go and play your tomfoolery and your drama uh, and thinking that you will confuse the citizens. They know, particularly in Mulawa and in Harare. In 2018, you were this confident president. You lost. We won. And you know that they were saved by the Constitutional Court. I don't know where you are getting your facts. You must be listening to ZANU-PF a lot. Where did we lose? You must be an extension of Mnangagwa. You must be listening to Mnangagwa a lot. We won. And you know that uh, ZANU-PF lost. And they, that's why they had to rely on the Constitutional Court. We, winners are not saved by the court. You, you're the one who went to court, President, not President Mnangagwa. Well, but it was supposed Mnangagwa had announced the wrong result. And he declared himself president. And he ultimately had to be declared by the Constitutional Court. These are facts. So Douglas Monzora is then right to pull out of the rest. I don't speak in behalf of Douglas. You can speak uh, to him. I'm sure he's able to, re to represent himself. Uh, I'm just saying from the facts that you're giving me here, that everything is stacked against We We don't quit. Winners don't quit. Winners are not whiners. We will fight. We will fight to the last dot. We will fight to the finishing line. That is what we have said. We have always known that it's against all odds, that the, the odds are stacked against us. But it doesn't mean that when we participate, we are happy with what's happening. From the delimitation, the voter straw, you talk of the issue of uh, the bans, banning of our rallies, a lot of other issues. Candidates have been treated with, with abuse, double candidates occasioned by ZEC and by FAS, by ZANU-PF. But we're still in the race. We managed to field candidates in almost all the constituencies and in the majority of our rural district councils against all odds. And we will continue to fight. I've noticed that you are being covered by the state broadcaster. Are you happy? I have not seen any coverage. Maybe they are here to cover us. We're not happy. I mean, it's not a, it's not, it's not a privilege to be covered. It's an obligation. This is a public broadcaster, though they are treating themselves as a state broadcaster, but they are a public broadcaster. They must cover all the candidates. I've never been on ZTV for the past seven years. 
Not that I want to be there. We have communicated our message without ZBC. We can still do communicate. And we want to thank the House and so. You have covered us so well. You have been fair to us. And I'm sure you have also been fair to ZANU-PF. That's how our media should be. Give the mic to all the voices. Give the opportunity to all the candidates so that they say their piece. Let the market decide. And the people and the citizens will decide who should be the candidate. So ZBC, we have issues with them. They still broadcast as if they are a broadcasting station for Mr. Mnangagwa and his family. And that's a problem. You, you spoke that once you get into power, you're going to change that. Not once we get into power. We are already there. We are changing. When we take over, we are going to change soon after the time of our inauguration. And if you don't become president? That's an impossibility. We are not uh, you know, professors of theory. We talk about practical issues. We are the next government. There's no doubt about that. You can go to analysts and professors. Those, those are the ones who can give you about you know, uh, different scenarios in all. You're, you not, you're not happy with professors, you said it. Well, look, I look at professors and at times I look at the professorial folly. And I just say, look, perhaps, you know, books and knowledge came along without wisdom. And I sympathize with them, some of them. When you were in, in Baitbridge, there was a headline, <clears throat> Chamisa cuts loan figure. And from the, from the state media. And uh, they argued that your senior party members are not with you at rallies. Now, th this is uh, hogwash. We are almost a year and some months old. We launched the Triple C on the 22nd of January. We have not officially launched the Triple C in terms of the structure that is going to there. What we have is a citizen structure, which is an interim structure. It does not have senior leaders. But you always want to import your seniority. Don't look at MDC Alliance and import it into Triple C. Triple C is a new kid on the block. You have this per chant of wanting to uh, put structures, titles that are not there. We don't have those titles. No cutting of loan figure. We have candidates across the whole country. Those are the chain champions that are leading the charge. Don't look at your people and the people you prefer and want to impose them on the Triple C. Don't impose leadership on the Triple C. So you are carrying the burden of this election alone. Not alone. There are chain champions across. Every region has chain champions. That's why you see the house full any time you go. Every constituent, there are chain champions that are leading there. There are cluster leaders that are there. It's a structure that is functioning and working very, very well. Some believe that this strategic ambiguity you talk about is even ambiguous to yourself. Well, but look, if it is ambiguous to myself, why would we be where we are? Strong, like ever. In fact, we are the strongest political party in this country. ZANPF is not even anywhere near us in terms of strength. We are the dominant force in this country. They have the army that they have abused. They have abused the police. They have abused the traditional leaders. They have abused the finances. They have abused the, the state media. They have abused uh, even the institutions like ZEC against us, including the courts. But they have not succeeded. Would you be successful against a weakly? It's because we are strong. And it's because they are weak. That's why they are you know, running elder scale in sixes and sevens. Because of our strength, you must be celebrating our strength rather than to look at these imaginary weaknesses and this imaginary ambiguity. There's no ambiguity. There's clarity of purpose. We are focused. We will win this election. We will win change for Zimbabwe. And we will win Zimbabwe for change. That is a fact. ZANU-PF are aware of it. That's why they are already saying, but you know, when Chamisa takes over, He's saying he'll do this and that. If there was no possibility, they would not be responding to that reality. You also spoke about violence as an issue. I mean, you buried... Um... I hope your answer that we're the next government. Because yeah. if you are in doubt, you are a victim of ambiguity. We are the next government. And let that sink. Not just in your mind. Even in the minds of ZANU-PF, it has already sunk. Let it be known that there's no way ZANU-PF is going to take leadership in this country. We are the next big deal in Zimbabwe. And we are ready to take Zimbabwe to stardom, to heights of glory. So with this confidence, if you lose, are you going to accept that you have lost? I have told you that we can't lose. We will not accept any fake things. There is fiction of loss. We will not accept anything. Victory is ours. We will win this election. Anything that is announced outside our victory is a lie, is fiction. What will you do if that lie comes? We will not allow lies to prevail.
Lies have always been fought throughout history, and we will fight this one. President, how do you fight an, an electoral system that pronounces a result that is supported by courts and the rules and laws of this country? How do you fight the that without becoming the a best, terrorist? The best courts to, de to announce and define an electoral winner is the people's court, the electorate. That is the highest court in elections. Any other court is a surrogate court, and we are going to win in that court, the court of the people, the court of public opinion, the citizens' court. My question is on the fight. How do you propose to the, this fight to happen? Our fight is superior. We will fight all forces, as we have always fought, and we have won. Look at the by-elections. We had contestations in 28 constituencies. We won 19 against all odds. In the council elections, we had 149. We won 89 out of the 149. That does not tell you of a week, you know. We are a giant. And you know that we are a giant because we have our faith in our God. And I know people have not understood it because they don't understand the God I serve and the God we serve. But he will show himself. Let's look at the role of the courts in this election so far. I think from the time I started reporting elections, this is one of the most controversial elections that have been fought in court before people actually cast votes. Oh, well, look, courts are supposed to be open chambers, a system of justice, to give people recourse when they are approached. And there's nothing wrong with that. The critical thing is that justice has to be dispensed. There must be independence of the judiciary, professionalism in the courts. Justice must be done. Justice must be served. The rule of law must be obeyed. And of course, fairness and equity must also be given to all the citizens. That is what we expect from our courts. It's one of the areas where we are going to reform and reform big to make sure that there's judicial independence, to make sure that there's no poisoning of the bench. There's no pecking of the bench on account of politics. The toxicity of politics has contaminated our bench, and that must go and that must be sorted out. The problem is not with the judges. The problem is the, with the contaminant. Those who are contaminating the judges, and that's politics, it must be fixed. Mm. But what does this say about Zek, the manner in which it handled the nomination court, and, uh, and the fact that, I mean, Zek is being tested every single day in court? Well, Zek, Zek, Zek is working under difficult circumstances. Again, this pollutant called politics, this toxicity of politics is cascading into all other institutions that are supposed to be independent. Was Zek is supposed to pass the constitutionality test, the credibility test, the independence test, and the non-partisan test. But those tests are failed on account of our politicians. It's mainly the politics that is corrupt, that is stupid, and that must be dealt with. And we must sympathize with all those in those institutions. They would want to save their country patriotically, professionally, but they are being contaminated by wrong and toxic politicians. And that is why we want to replace those politicians, so that we are the new leadership, we are the new politicians, and we are the new government to correct those mistakes. Do you feel for Sevier Kasukwere, who was plucked out of the ballot paper by the court? I wish I could be his Sevier. Unfortunately, I'm not. But I feel sorry for him. You know, Sevier can't save himself, and it's a very sad situation. He was supposed to be on the ballot, and he has to be on the ballot. But we'll correct that situation. I'm sure he will run next time in the next election, possibly against the government ourselves. The, this law that was used, let's talk about it, that if you are not in the country for 18 consecutive months, you must be removed from the voters' role. It's an anti-people legislation. It's an anti-citizens legislation. It renders a citizen stateless and residentless. You know, you can't take away rights. There can never be taxation without representation. You are receiving a lot of money from the diasporans. You can't then say you can't vote or we've taken your right to be represented or to represent others. That's wrong. That's obnoxious. Those are some of the pieces of legislation that we are going to change, including the whole issue about the new constitution to give back the rights to the citizens. You must be voted for if you are a Zimbabwean citizen, wherever you are. If people have nominated you, that's why there's a nomination. If you are nominated, there's confidence from the people. You have fulfilled the requirements and you have 
managed to meet the bill. So be on the, on the candidates list. So yes, we don't agree with that one. I mean, I just wanted to find out how, how, how is this law even implementable? Like how do you look at, how do you even uh, uh, come to a decision that this person has not been in the country for 18 months? Well, look, cowards always resort to all those kinds of things. And I'm sure Mr. Mnangagwa is the best person to answer because he's the one who's benefiting from it. I'm not a beneficiary. I'm a victim. I would have wanted Kasugwere to be there because the more the merrier. If Kasugwere had been in the race, I would have beaten both Mr. Mnangagwa and Mr. Kasukere as ZANU-PF candidates. It's even better, because then you know that you are dealing with a divided opponent. But of course, Mnangagwa is afraid. He's so weak. He thought that Kasukere would be number two after our victory. So he was, he's fighting for number two, and he doesn't want Kasukere to be number two. And tough luck for Kasukere. But what would you, what would you do differently uh, uh if looking, looking back as an opposition leader, what would you have done differently going into this election, if anything? Well, you keep wanting to take me back to putting on the mindset of an opposition leader. First of all, I don't agree with that kind of language and terminology. There is no ruling an opposition. There is governing and the alternative government, the alternative party. That is what other jurisdictions have taken, or the majority and the minority, uh, in other advanced democracies. But be that as it may, if I were in Mnangagwa's position, I would have allowed for reforms to kick in so that there is satisfaction by all the parties. I would have allowed the voters' flow to be available to all who care to have the voters' flow at their disposal. I would have also managed to allow for freedom for political parties to contest. Mr. Kasukwere, allow him to be on the candidates list. Those candidates who were bad, allow them to be there. No nomination fees that are extortionate. Because it's almost extortion for, for you to say that you want 20,000 pay presidential candidate. How would they have allowed that? I would have done things differently. But more importantly, I would have performed better so that I don't resort to uh, dead tactics toward of opponents. I would have really won the election fair and clear on the basis of what I've delivered, on the basis of my policies, on the basis of a good track record. Right now he has no track record. That's why he has to rely on destroying opponents. But, but, you, but how do you say that? He has built dams? He has, he has tarred roads? Um, Those dams were built by Mugabe. He's just benefiting from Mugabe's work. There is nothing that he has done. If anything, even those dams, they are not as uh, uh, pleasing as one would want. You know. When you complete a dam, you have not built a dam. You are just completing what was begun long back. Even these roads, they were all planned by Mugabe. Don't take Mugabe's glory. It's is usually it, weak people who want to bask in the glory of others. Is That's it, a Mugabe glory. Is it not leadership, uh, President Chamisa, to come into government and complete government projects because... Well, look, if you complete, that's fine. But this is not his credit. He's completing somebody's work. And this must go to Mr. Mugabe, not Mr. Mnangagwa. We are here to see what he did. And he has not done anything. He built bridges. There were places where there were not bridges. I mean, you are also even not confident of those bridges. You go to them, they are not bridges. You know, when you build a footbridge, don't come to us and say that you have built a bridge. You know, we need real bridges. Like Bechna Bridge. You know, those are the bridges we want to see. World class you know, infrastructure, not what we have seen. Karanda is an embarrassment. Even people in Karanda are embarrassed. Now, when a leader is always doing embarrassing things, don't celebrate mediocrity, because that's what also gives false glory to people in leadership. Please don't do that. Bullet, don't do that. Come Let's look at real issues, infrastructure of not. When somebody does such a little thing, you build a tax shop and you celebrate, no, you have built a supermarket. No. The standard is too low. The bar has been set too low. Let's raise the bar of leadership. He blames you for the problems that he, his government faces, sanctions squarely on your shoulders. Well, because he knows that uh, this country is under two jurisdictions. One is a ruler, one is a leader. He knows that we are providing leadership. He is providing rulership. So there's a ruling party and a leading party. He's, he's fair. He, 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 you must give credit to Mr. Mnangagwa for knowing where the real deal is, for knowing 
who the real leader is. He appreciates. And I appreciate that he acknowledges our leadership and our legitimacy. So you accept that you are the thorn, you are the problem. You know, when you are a thorn in the flesh of the devil, you must celebrate because you know that you represent light. And I'm so proud of you. You said that when you get into power, you are going to call Biden and get the sanctions listed. So you are responsible for what's burdening the people of Zimbabwe. Well, I was simply saying that when the leadership is right, when the leadership settings are in proper position, it doesn't take any time to resolve issues. Let's tick all our boxes. Let's have a checklist of our governance deficit, human rights deficit. Stop harassing journalists. Stop arresting journalists. Allow journalists to operate freely. Stop arresting lawyers who are doing their work. Release job scholar. Release Ngarufume. No political prisoners. Do your bit. Allow opposition to hold their meetings or the alternative parties to have their meetings. Don't use un um, under underhand tactics or arm tactics to arm twist the, the alternative. Just be a leader. Stick to good governance. Respect human rights. Let there be good policies. Abandon this thing of killing people. What they did to our young men, Tinashe. What they did to Mbonen Nui and Kwekwe. What they are doing to people in the rural areas. Stop kidnapping people, threatening people, abducting people. Stop harassing people, using traditional leaders to abuse people in the villages. And even oppressing and terrorizing our traditional leaders. That should stop. Once you have done that, there will not be any country that will put any measures against our country. Because you would have sorted out our own part of the bargain. You can't remove the speck in the eye of the international community when you have not dealt with a log in your own eye. ZANU PF, you have a log in your eye. Deal with that log. Don't look at the speck in Europe's eye. Don't look at the speck in the United States of America. I'm not a spokesperson of the United States of America. But let's deal with our own log in our own eyes as a country. Our deficits in good governance, our human rights record. Let's respect our citizens. Once we have done that, we can then build bridges with the whole world. In fact, it is the whole world that will approach us, not us approaching them. Uh, you, you, you spoke about Tinashe, may his soul rest in peace. But the police have said that he was run over by a truck, he was not killed by Zanpi. If you are going to believe that, my brother, you might as well believe that, you know, Bule, you are a woman and you will be nine months pregnant in the next eight, eight months or so. That's propaganda. Don't listen to that propaganda. You are a man, but if somebody says you are a woman, it doesn't matter, they say it a million times, it will not change the facts. The fact is that Tinashe was killed, and Tinashe is murdered on account of politics. And that's unfortunate. No citizen must die on account of politics. What is even more tragic is the fact that Mr. Menangagwa is leader. I don't agree with his leadership, but he's the leader who is there. He's supposed to show remorse. He's supposed to show sympathy with the family and go out of his way to make sure that he discourages and punishes all those people who are involved in this two and bill. The Minister of Home Affairs issued a statement and said that the police are acting, in fact 12 people have been arrested. Is that not going out of... Wow, but a loss of a life, go to the United States of America, go to China, the loss of one life would cause the whole nation to come to standstill. Because life is precious. We're not talking about an animal here. We're talking about a human being, a human soul. Life is sacrosanct. Human life is important. Things have to stop. The president must be able to ask, issue a, a, a clear instruction and a clear instruction to deal with the problem. This thing of sending the minister, the minister is too small for this kind of a problem. President, I, I, I understand that you have to rush to Mkai, but let, let, talk to me about the rural uh, uh, campaigns that you've been having. Well, look, fantastic. People in the rural areas are very clear. That's why ZANU PF is in sixes and sevens. They are panicking like a snake. You know why? They know that we have the hearts of the people in the rural areas. The rural electorate is solid. That's why they are using violence against them. You will never use violence on people who support you. Where there is love and charity, there is no violence and coercion. You can't use command where there is persuasion or where there is a persuaded heart. So yes, the rural areas are are taken over. They are yellow. They are spoken. You know, they, they've accepted the change message. And we are proud. We are happy. 
I'm so excited with the significant inroads we have made. But guess what? That has also attracted them problems. That's why they are now being victimized. You're not worried about the trinkets uh, that they are receiving, the milli meal, uh, the chickens, the goats, the balls? Rural areas are occupied and populated by our parents. We all came from the rural areas. We are rural people. I mean, they are wise. They raised us up on account of their wisdom. So you can't tell me that they don't know what to do under these circumstances. They are so sophisticated and advanced in dealing with dictators, in dealing with those who are using force on them. But ultimately, we must preserve lives. And we've said, let's adopt the bull mango strategy. Be green, Zanu outside, but in, inward, be yellow. Support change, be for change. Let's support one people, one vision and one nation message, the mantra to unite people so that ultimately we save lives and preserve lives in communities. And you're sure that will work? It will work. It will provide a dividend. We are also doing our own bit to provide security in the rural areas. The police seem overwhelmed in the rural areas and we're actually helping police through citizens' policing, protecting each other as citizens in legal and lawful manner, in peaceful means and peaceful ways. And it has actually been bearing fruit. What is, last time you didn't perform very well in Matebelele, and now you're in Blawayo, we're speaking in the heart of the city, of or the, the city of kings and queens. Let us talk about your strategy. When you too. say we didn't perform very well, what do you mean, Bule? You lost uh, most rural uh, seats in, in, in Matebelele. Just in Matebelele and South. We had more votes, presidential in Matno. We had more votes uh, for parliament in Matno. You know, uh, so we have always done very well. We had all the votes in, in Ulawai, which is Matebele. In Mat South, we had a small gap, but of course we had lesser votes in the parliament. We are working on that. That's why we have been putting more em emphasis and focus in the rural constituency. Yesterday you spoke deeply about Kukraunde. Is this an attempt to win the match? Not we, we, the we, 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 we don't deal with such fundamental issues for politics or for votes. These are deep statements and positions of conviction. Injustices, past, current, or future, must be dealt with and must be avoided. We must not bury our head in the sand. We must attack and tackle the monsters and the demons that are you know, buffeting our country. That's why Gukura Wundi must be sorted out. We can't allow this wound to fester and fester forever. It must be dealt with, not on account of politics or seeking votes. We don't seek votes in tragedies. We don't seek votes in circumstances of or hardship. You know, we, we want the situation to be sorted out. And we want this country to be healed so that we are able to move forward. Blood loss can never be recovered, but we must not allow that blood to be lost again on account of politics. But President Emerson Mnangagwa is also dealing with this Kukura Wunde issue. But how can a perpetrator deal with the, the consequences of his uh, misdeeds, his omissions and commissions? He needs, actually, he needs to be saved. And that's why we are the best candidates to help him. He can't help himself. How do you help yourself when you are neck deep in the mud? Is it not a show of remorse? Well, look, show of remorse is not adequate. We don't show remorse by imposing a solution. It must be bottom up rather than top down. And that's why it has not had traction with the people of Matebele. Because we are, there's no genuineness. It must be done genuinely. And you must understand that it requires a cleaner hand to help him wash him. President, just, just as we close, there have been people in the past who have been supporting you but are attacking you left, right and center, especially on social media. Who are these people? Jonathan Moyer. And you're saying they've supported us in the past? Yes. He no, said, they, they've supported themselves in the past, hoping that they would use us to advance their goals. You know, they have never supported us. They've supported themselves through us. So you must make the distinction. They it's all about they, themselves. They, they came, the, the Jonathan Moy actually made claims that he brought in, uh, uh, you know, designs for, for your campaign material and also wanted to assist. And, you know. No player chooses supporters. No leader chooses followers. If you choose to follow me and you choose to follow another, it's your right. There's nothing criminal about it. But the issue is not about the one who was being followed, but the one who is following.
So I'm sure he will be able to speak but those, to them. Those, those who have followed you, are, are you not worried that they have now decided not to follow you? And are you introspecting yourself? Are, to you, also, are you also looking at the new followers who are following us? When we lose one, we gain a million. And we lose one on account of principle. We don't want manipulation. We don't want abuse. We do want principled leadership. And that's what we continue to provide. Top musician Holly Tain just recently begged President Emerson Nangagwa that, and, and, and you're supposed to be appealing to the youthful vote. You're losing it, aren't you? You think Holly Tain would appeal to youth more than we have done? If you believe that, my brother, you must be living in some other you know, planet. Come back to the earth and appreciate the circumstances. Holy Tain must be holy. Otherwise, his unholy alliances are not going to benefit him. He will lose support because young people don't connect with what he's supporting. Young people don't want this kind of misery and darkness. Holy Ten, please be holy and support holiness. President, as you close, maybe I'll just ask you to speak from your heart a message to the people of Zimbabwe as we go into this election. What is, what is weighing heavily on your heart? I'm, I'm here, I'm, uh, President, I'm going, to, I'm going to try and guide you because I want something that's novel, something that first is ahead here on Free Talk. Well, fellow Zimbabweans, the task we have is huge. We are not choosing parties. We are not choosing individuals. We are choosing hope. This is not about C or ZANU-PF. It's about our future. And the future is represented by this candidate. Trust this future. Trust the hope that we are bringing. Hope in your life. Hope in your pocket. Hope in your circumstances. Please support light. Choose light. Choose jobs. Choose health. Choose prosperity. Choose freedom. Choose us. We thank you. We love you. God is in it. I, I just want, you, you spoke something around, um, around a, a lean cabinet. Indeed. 15 ministers. Indeed. Would you want to give us the portfolios of these ministers? Well, we have the portfolios and they are going to be announced in due course. But we already have. In fact, we already have a, a shadow cabinet. It will be announced. And it's an inclusive cabinet. It's a cabinet for everyone. Inclusive you bring in Zanapia? Oh, yes. Everyone who is good enough to serve people of Zimbabwe. That's the future. The future is not divisive. The future is diverse. President, what is your favorite food? I mean, people would want to know. Well, um, I'm a villager. So I, I, I love, uh, you know, traditional food, traditional meals. But chicken is my favorite. You give me a chicken makaya, you know, traditionally, pre you know, prepared. Yes, I will visit you anytime. What do you drink, President? I, I drink water and, of course, more importantly, I, I, I drink, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit. That's what I drink. What is, would be your favorite color? Yellow. Of course, that's why we are gold. But white for peace is also my other color. You've largely kept your family out of the public sphere. Why? Well, they are not politicians. Uh, they are not public figures. Uh, I'm the one who is in the public space. But of course, on account of uh, their connection to me, they are also in the public arena. But look, we don't want them to be. The biggest problem is when you are a wife to a prophet, you are not a prophetess. When you are a wife to a president, you are not a presidentess. When you are a wife to a professor, you are not a professoress. This whole thing of wanting to try and import roles in a manner, yes, you are the first lady, you must do first-led roles, without importing the politics into it, without dividing people. The first-led must unite all, even those in the other political parties. That is the difference. But fundamentally, they support their husbands. Of and course. And they support your ideology. Of course. So they are part of your ideology. Indeed. But they cannot then be an extension or wanting to compete, as we have seen in the past, that the husband is almost like you have two presidents. On TV there, you see uh, even the wife has more coverage as a politician, not as a supporting, you know, to the husband or as the first lady leading in charity and other work that is supposed to be done. We want to change that cycle. I mean, look at South Africa, look at other countries. They have first ladies there, but the orientation is different. We want to change our politics. How do you spend your free time? In prayer. 
with God. It's so beautiful. Try it, my brother. You will never regret. It gives you inner strength. The inner man is strong. The spiritual gym is stronger than any gym you can ever think of. Here on earth, who are you close to? Here on earth, I'm close to people like you. People who give me better ideas. People who also respect me. Anyone who respects me, I'm close to. And I have many people who are close to me. People who don't betray. People who don't beg bite. People who are principled. People who serve others. People who live for others. Those are my friends. You're, you're the father, President Chamisa. How, how do you relate with your children? Well, I have time for them. I'm a father to them. I'm not a politician. Most politicians make the mistake of thinking that their families are a political gathering. They want to address them as such. I don't do that. I'm an ordinary man, an ordinary father to my children. They also want that fatherly warmth. So I provide fatherhood to my children. Do you go to sports? They also run oh, oh, Yes, I do, and I do it when I try. But the biggest sport for me is college. So I'm always with the people. But when I am not in that sport, I have to be a I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Blawayo. You have been so kind to us. And we have been enjoying your hospitality and your ambience. Blawayo has been beautiful. To me, your host as usual, Dara Blessed Mplanga. On this, your free talk, in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. Now, I was in conversation with Advocate Nelson Chamisa, the leader of the Triple C, and he was saying he is a piece of trusted hands. He is looking to bring peace. He is looking to end the legacy of violence. He is looking to put Zimbabwe on the map of business, mining, free education, and he is asking for your vote. The decision is yours. You are the citizens of this country. You know what you want this country to look like. August 23, you walk into that ballot, you make a decision for the betterment of Zimbabwe. The choice is yours. The candidates are on the ballot box. We, on Free Talk, we allow everyone to be heard. Now, thank you for joining us and choosing us as your station of choice. And thank you, Blawayo, for being fair to us. Until next time, I am your host, Dara B, as usual. I'm out. Uh, President Nelson Chimisa, and I wish you the best in what you do. God bless you, my brother. And may God bless you. Thank you.